Welcome to part two of this weekly Q&A video. Thanks to those of you that already checked out part one. If you haven't, make sure that you do so after you watch this part two, or maybe before, but make sure you watch both videos either way. Thanks again to all those of you that took to Twitter and asked your questions, and make sure if you're first time checking me out, smash that subscribe button, please. Thank you. Let's go ahead and get started. Mojo Jojo kicks us off by asking, in your opinion, are any of these 2000 quarterbacks Hall of Famers? So these guys from the 2000s. Carson Palmer, Donovan McNabb, Drew Bledsoe, Jeff Garcia, I just didn't feel quite crisp. Matt Hasselbeck, Rich Gannon, Steve McNair, Mark Brunel, Tony Romo, Michael Vick. Oh boy. Romo didn't win shit, so that's going to hurt him. He, he's a guy that put up some numbers, but what did they really mean in the grand scheme of things? So he's a no. Um, Vic should have been, but he won't be. And he only has himself to blame. Uh, McNair was in that category of very good, but I don't put him in the Hall of Fame class. Although as a player, I always respected him. Outside of the game, I'm just wondering, what the hell were you doing? Like, you should still be here, man. So dumb. Rich Gannon was a league MVP in no way, shape, or form. Makes him a Hall of Famer. Hasselbeck was good. Not that great. Mark Brunel, same type of story. Um, you know, you look at Bledsoe, he'll always be remembered as the guy that Brady replaced. But Bledsoe had some good years. Early on in his career in New England, like by year four, he was taking the Patriots to the Super Bowl. Yes, they lost to Green Bay, but still, you know, like he was early on in his career, he was the epitome of a young franchise quarterback. He took him out of Washington State, number one. You know, another one of those quarterback classes where is it Drew Bledsoe or Rick Meyer? Who's the real number one pick? And they took Bledsoe, and by the fourth season, he was in the Super Bowl. Like that's kind of the trajectory you used to want to want want to have when you took a quarterback number one overall. Um, but I just don't think there's enough there to support his Hall of Fame case, similar with Carson Palmer. Some pretty good years, but in a friendlier, pass-happy pass league. Um, Donovan McNabb may have the best resume just because of the team success, even though, again, he did not win the championship. I think that hurts him. Um, I still don't think his case is strong enough. So out of all of them, I don't think any of them really are truly Hall of Famers. We can't just put kind of good or good for a period of time. Like, Hall of Fame is supposed to represent the great ones, true greatness, true icons, and none of these guys are. Matt Thievish asks, if the Animal Kingdom had a field of football team, which do you want playing quarterback? An elephant. Can't sack the son of a bitch. Smart as hell. Can see the entire field easily. And with the trunk, Got a rocket launcher. Yeah, I'll take the I'll take the elephant. Just don't you be dirty and throw any mice on the damn field. Trinell Sally. Do you think OJ did it alone or had help? Um, let's, I mean, let's really honestly think about this for a second. That happened back in 1994. OJ came into the league in 69, which I believe means he was born in about 47. So at the time of the crimes, he was somewhere between like 46, 47 years old. Maybe 48. Uh, but I think he was like 47. Fact check me if I'm wrong there, but that's pretty close to accurate. And at that time, he was a former NFL running back, yes, but also a guy with knee and knee problems and hip problems, back problems, I also believe shoulder problems. And you're talking about an intimate, up-close crime like that, not a shooting, not a strangle somebody in their sleep, but being able to slice to death two people in a courtyard type of area, whatever the hell it was back then in Brentwood in 94. Um... I find it hard to believe he did it by himself. I, I do. I really do. The Pack God. Do you like the direction the NFL is heading in terms of the high-powered offenses and innovative play calling? Um, I think it works better than it does in the NBA because the NBA, to me, went too far with it. There's no balance. I like balance. There are no quality low post players, realistically. I mean, you're going to bring up some fluke names, but in general, you don't have big men. You don't have post games for most of these teams, most of these big men now. They're all wings. Um, it's too much about jacking up a bunch of threes. There's just isn't a crazy amount of skill in today's game. You know, not a lot of physicality, not much brutality. There's not a lot of toughness. Like it's it's a 
It's a soft-ass league now, whereas at least with the NFL, while, yes, it's opened up, it's become even more offense-friendly, and you see teams score a lot of points, you'll still get some big plays on defense. You still can have superstar defensive players. You get in just enough physicality, just enough brutality, just enough toughness to remind you of the core roots of the game. So I think for the NFL, it works a lot better. For the NBA, not so much. Herpy Man. Who should the GOP throw out in 2024? Good God, that is an interesting question. And I hate the fact that we even have to start asking these questions when that type of stuff is, should be two and a half, three, three and a half years away from us even having to think about what's wrong with us. Um, whoever they have at that time that can best appeal to their base, to appeal to those rural, white, working-class Trump voters that could possibly maintain some of the margins in some areas with the non-white communities that Trump had. Like, if you're the GOP, you look at Trump and say, yeah, Trump lost, and a lot of it, what helped get him in office in part, what helped get him support from voters in some of those swing states was his approach. He was a star. He wasn't the regular politician. Ultimately, was his undoing. But at the same point in time, a lot of the message that he was talking about and a lot of the things that he stood for worked very, very well down ballot for House Republican candidates and Senate Republican candidates and Senate Republican incumbents. So, um, you know, they're probably going to want to stay as close to the Trump formula as possible. Maybe find somebody they can control just a little bit more. Um, who that's going to be in four years. Like, for all you know, Trump sits there January 20th. 2021, and he sits there and announces he's running in 2024 for all we know. Good God, who knows? Um, I don't know. It's a great question. A lot of things can change in the next couple of years. So I don't know if they have one that they should really stick their hopes to at this point. BPEF00, what are the chances that any of the NBA's more undesirable contracts, Al Horford, Gordon Hayward, uh, Gary or Tobias Harris, Russell Westbrook, etc. Get moved this offseason. Do you think CBA adjustments for COVID help or hurt those chances? Potentially hurts. Um, if I saw any of those salaries being moved, maybe Gordon Hayward. Uh, certainly could be Russell Westbrook might be getting dumped out of Houston. Um, you know, just a important reminder that there are consequences when you pay some of these lesser players big contracts. Excuse me, let me not say that about Westbrook, but some of these other guys like Horford and Hayward, like, you better really be right if you're going to pay them that much money, because if you're not, it's going to really hurt your organization long term. NASA Man 21, how surprised are you about Herbert's performance? What would you do at head coach? Um, Herbert was my QB1, although I did have some concerns about him, but I think in part it just shows us that the Oregon system didn't get much out of him. It did not deploy him in his best possible light. Um, I also think we should be a little less surprised if these rookie quarterbacks come into the league and play play pretty well initially because the league is so quarterback friendly and so pass happy friendly now that it's just not as big of a deal as it once is. So we probably shouldn't be as surprised. But man, he has looked really, really good so far. Danny Luckenheimer, who do you think is the most overrated QB of all time? Also, who do you think is the most underrated QB of all time? Most Overrated quarterback of all time. Joe Namath. He had star power and he had the guarantee and he had Super Bowl three, but his numbers were doo doo. Just call it how it is. Like they were really, really bad. Um, most underrated quarterback of all time. Um, I don't know if it goes on as underrated. I think in some ways he goes underappreciated because of the situation he he was in. I think it's Steve Young in San Francisco. Like he was a guy that got all that money to go to the USL USFL, even though he never really got all that money. And then the league folded, and then he goes to Tampa, and it doesn't go well there. And he, Bill Walsh trades for him. I think it was in the '87 season, and he sits behind Montana for years. And you know, you got several great years out of Steve Young before injuries forced him out of the game, but. There's a guy right there, you know, was consistently towards the top of the league in terms of quarterback rating, in terms of completion percentage, like league MVP, Super Bowl MVP, all of that. Like, I think that's a guy that kind of gets goes under the radar and slept on in terms of just how great he truly was at his peak. I really, really do. Because he had to follow in Joe Cool's shadow. And not an easy thing to do, for sure. Um, Kyle Gardner, 92. 
I'm thinking about venturing into the world of buying and investing in stocks. Do you have any tips for someone who is a beginner and has limited experience with buying and selling stocks? Uh, this may come across, Kyle, as being a smart ass. Please don't think of it like that too much, but maybe a little bit, is you're asking me, somebody who is in no way an expert on stocks, um, about advice on stocks. So maybe that is a good indication of you should be really careful what you're getting into. What I would say is you live in an information age. It is everywhere, of course. you got to sort through some of the crap and so forth, but there's plenty of sites that talk about it. There are books that you can get to talk about it. You know, I could also say if you have a 401k, um, maybe look at your 401k and see how you're investing in that and maybe see if you want to up the amount that you contribute or change your contributions. Um, I would certainly try to seek out people that actually know about stocks and know about the markets. Although a lot of times you'll find that a lot of these so-called experts don't perform that much better than others. They really don't. Um, so what I would say is when you think about investing, you know, don't invest any money that you can't afford to lose. That might be the best advice I could give you. That's the best advice I could give you. And then do your research. Frederick Lohaus, who of the first year NFL head coaches do you think is doing the best? Oh God, now you're gonna make me think. Why do people gotta make me think? Ah. Who the hell are even the first-year coaches? Oh. The NFC East has three of them, so that's three no's. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, good God. Maybe Matt Rule in Carolina. Who am I forgetting, guys? Who am I forgetting? Am I forgetting somebody? I don't think so. No, I think it's Matt Rule in Carolina, probably. Yeah. If I forgot somebody... Feel free to blast blast away at me in the comments. You're probably going to say uh, Stefanski in Cleveland. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll throw out Stefanski in Cleveland. That, that's fair. We'll, we'll go with him. Uh, Jake White, do you think this is Drew Brees' last year? And What do you think the Saints will do with the quarterback position when he does retire? I think there's a very strong likelihood that this is his last year. And if it is his last year, they probably will try to give Jameis some type of like two-year, $45 million type of contract to keep him and see what they got with him would be my initial instinct. Is it going to be drafting too low to really get a franchise changer? It's going to cost them way too much in terms of draft pick capital trade up and get one. So that would be the easiest path that I could see for them. Uh, the rain speaks great English. Good for you. Ask which QB has the best chance to revive their career on another team next season? Between Sam Darnold, Dwayne Haskins, Mitchell Trubisky, and Daniel Jones. I think it's Sam Darnold. He's the most talented of those four. He was also arguably put into the worst situation of those four. So I'll go Sam Darnold. Absolutely. Darren asks, will Donald Trump ever concede? I, I don't. Who knows what to expect with him? He lives for this. He loves this. He's the world's greatest troll. Like, he is the greatest troll of all time. Um, he might at some point, but he also might not. I could see both happening. They have 50-50 chance. Absolutely. Rio Cody Martin, what's the chances that Trump runs in 2024 and beats Biden? I think it's possible because Biden's just a corporate dem with dementia. Also, Trump got over 71 million votes. Um, let's tackle that in a couple of things, Cody. Uh, first, Trump ain't exactly a spring chicken either, and he had plenty of moments over the past four years where he demonstrated some kind of sleepy, forgetty, joey type of moment. So let's not get too cocksure in your guy. Um, you're also assuming that Biden would even run in 2024 as what, an 82 year old man? I find that very, very hard to believe. Like this was a transition, let's set up Kamala for 2024 type of scenario. What are the chances Trump runs in 2024? Who knows what, if any legal trouble he might be in at that time? Who knows what his situation will be at that point in time? Um, I won't dismiss anything though. He got elected once. And even though he got kicked out of office, let's say the next four years don't get a whole lot better or other bad things happen, like God only knows what could happen. But I would not put my money on it at this point. Uh, and then Brink Doofus is going to close us out. Do you support another possible lockdown, yay or nay? Like it's, a, it's a tough thing because people aren't wearing their masks and they aren't social distancing. So it brings up these possibilities of having to do these stupid lockdowns, but how much are these lockdowns really going to help? Like it's a vicious, never-ending cycle because Americans are stupid. But then there's also the thing of even if you do all of this stuff, it seems like it just doesn't matter that much with COVID. And the fact of the matter is, 
is that this is still a relatively new strain of virus that a lot of the, even the medical professionals, the doctors, didn't know everything about. You know, they talk about follow the science. Well, the science has changed an awful lot on this over the past uh, 11, 12 months or so. So um, another lockdown. If we actually were able to say, hey, instead of doing like the PPP projects and just giving away money to corporate folks and rich people that didn't need the help, uh, if you told me that you were actually going to do some type of UBI for the next couple of months and give real stimulus and real help, then I could potentially support it. You know, but that's not going to happen. So unfortunately, I got to say no. Um, I don't think there should be another lockdown, and not like there was ever a national lockdown to begin with, which again is part of the problem. You have 50 states all doing their own kind of different strategies here. And um, so no, do not support another lockdown, you know, because does it really work? Like, does it really truly work? Like, you can sit there and say, well, it'll slow the tide a little bit when it comes to uh, the the hospital systems throughout the country not being overwhelmed and overloaded with patients. That's a valid argument to have. Um, but then you say, okay, so you're just squeezing the balloon out, and then in a few weeks as you open back up, you'll be right back in the same boat again. Like, what the hell good does it do? And that's unfortunate, but that's the reality. So, no, uh, I, I wish people would just wear their masks and wear them properly. It's really not that hard. I don't like wearing masks. It's annoying. It's uncomfortable. And you know what? When I go out in public, I fucking do it. Like, there are certain things to complain and bitch about that are very valid. This is not one of them. Just shut up and wear your goddamn mask. Seriously. It's not that hard. It's like one of these situations you hear a lot in the business world talking about this is not the hill I choose to die on. And too often in America now, people from all different sides of the spectrum want to piss and moan and bitch and complain about every effing little damn thing. Pick your battles, people, and masks aren't one of them. Wear your God-blessed mask. Try to stay away from the tremendous social gatherings as much as you can. They're small sacrifices. Again, not that hard. If it bothers you that much, then who's the snowflake here? But when we get to the start talking about the lockdown stuff, like, no. I just don't. People aren't going to hear to it anyways. Like, a lot of problems with it. So, um, anyways... That's all I have for this Q&A. This one ran a little bit longer. Lots of good questions on. I enjoyed it. So thank you guys so much for your questions. I'll probably do another one of these Q&As in a week or two. Make sure otherwise you keep checking back on this channel. I have lots of other content coming up. So stay tuned.